Hey, what's up? My name is Samuel Leeds. I'm a property investor. And on this Q&A Sunday, I'm going to be giving a lot of very interesting, unique perspectives on property investing. You see, I've been getting loads of questions from the last week's video. I'm going to be answering and addressing all the questions that I've been getting in the comment box on YouTube. What I want you to do as a viewer, someone watching this video right now, is I want you to listen, take notes, enjoy, but also comment your questions below. And next Sunday, I'm gonna answer your property investment questions. So anything about how to get into property, how to finance a property, how to be a property entrepreneur, anything at all, niggly, small, big, broad, specific, comment below. Let's see what questions we had last week. Melanie, Melanie says, Samuel, love your content, but I think the background noise is a bit distracting. My bad. Hopefully on this video, the background noise is less distracting. But just my personal opinion, would you go for off-market plan properties? They offer 7% reassured rent in the first year and deals seem to be quite good. Or rather go for older properties which are slightly cheaper but might require some maintenance. Melanie, thank you for your amazing question and I hope the music is more suited to your taste this week. Listen, I'd be really careful about properties like that because when they give you a guaranteed rent like that with a deal for the first year, I've had this happen before. I've bought packaged investments and what sometimes happens is it is guaranteed. They do give it you for the first year, but what they do is they give you more the first year than you're ever gonna get ever again. And they use that as a sales tool to get you to buy the property because you think, oh wow, guaranteed rent for the first year of a grand a month. But then after the year, it drops to 400 pound a month and you're like, this is terrible investment because you just assumed guaranteed for the first year will probably maintain the same, you know? So I'd be really careful on that front. Also, did you say it was a new build? New builds, if you buy a property that's a new build as an investment, often what happens is you buy it and the value drops straight away. I, Melanie, would be very careful. I would find your own deals and I would find, yeah, probably older properties um, and, and, and I'd be very, very careful. And if you want to send more details on what you're being offered, I'm happy to look at it, but be careful. That's my advice. Hope that helps. What else we got? Erastus, cool name, man. Erastus, he says, thanks for the useful nuggets of info, SL. Welcome, thank you for watching and being a subscriber. You better be subscribed or I'll find you. I want to buy a four bed and convert it to a six bed HMO. I am worried about licenses. Should I go with a builder and a council officer for a viewing before purchase and then do a RICS valuation before I make a firm offer? And can the council deny me a license after doing all the works on the initial visit using bridging for the first time? So very cautious about it, thanks. Erastus, I wanna say two things. Firstly, I wanna say it's right that you should be cautious. Getting a bridging loan on buying a HMO when you don't fully understand the licensing and all the rules and stuff, that is something that is quite a big deal for a first time investor. I don't know if you're first time or not, but that's a big deal. So that's the first thing, you're right to be cautious. Second thing I'll say is you're right to be taking action and to be doing this and to be watching the videos and going out looking at properties. So, you know, you've not said anything in this, which makes me think that you're missing the big picture or you're ignorant of something. What I would say though is you say you're worried about getting up, you're worried about the licenses. You can find out very easily if a property is going to need a license or not. And you can do that on Google. And generally speaking, if it's a HMO which is going to hold five or more people, you'll need a license. Getting a license isn't that bad and you're right to speak to the council to see what the crack is before you buy the house. Also to get a builder to, before you buy the house. That's correct. You're also, it's never a bad idea to get a RICS valuation, um, depending on what the plan is with the property. You probably don't need to get a RICS valuation just to buy it. You can just, if you're getting a mortgage on the property, which you should be, because you should be using a, a loan to buy the property. Um, you mentioned a bridging, a bridging loan. So are you talking RICS valuation on the end value, in which case smart? If you're just buying it as a, as a buy to let slash HMO, buying it and renting it out, you, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't get a RICS valuation necessarily because if you're getting finance on the property, the lender is gonna need to go around the property and that, they'll give you an idea of the value of the house. So that's just some general thoughts. Sounds to me like you probably could do some extra training. I'd recommend you go and check out Samuel365. If you go on samuel365.com, You'll be able to join a community where you can ask questions, talk, have access to myself and our coaches, and we'll be able to walk you through this deal. Good job, good luck, keep us posted. Okay, BMX vloggers. Cool, man, good to have you with us. Do you, did you know anything about property when you bought your first house at 17? Yes, I did know stuff about property when I bought my first house at 17. I didn't know as much as I know now, nowhere near, 
but I knew more than most people. And even though I was only 17, not educated, I educated myself. So when I left school at 16 and I became a property investor, I decided I wanted to be a property investor, I went on some training programs and I really learned my craft. And it's, I think people underestimate how fast you can get knowledge. When you go on training programs, go networking, put yourself out there, you can get up to speed pretty quick. It's like my property investors crash course. It's a two day crash course, you can do it online now, but it's a two day program. You can get very good knowledge in a couple days. So although I was 17, I was very young, I didn't have any experience. I knew quite a bit about property because I'd learned, because I'd trained myself. Um, did I make mistakes? Absolutely, you know, but I knew a reasonable amount. Bought my first house at 17 and I put it in someone else's name, a family member's name, actually my stepdad, and he kind of was like a guarantor, held it for me until I was old enough and able to then switch it over to my name. That's how my first deal worked. Great question though. I don't know how old you are, but get smart, get educated and go crazy. Okay, um, Hadra, Hadra. Good to have you with us, Hadra. Hi Samuel, please speak about how rules regarding HMOs in Oxford differ from other areas. I'm interested in rent to rent in Oxford. Very specific question there. Um, in Oxford, I do know about Oxford and HMOs. I've got, uh, I haven't got any HMOs personally in Oxford. I do have a serviced accommodation unit, which I use as a holiday, like a holiday home type thing. My, some of my students have HMOs in Oxford. They have rent to HMOs as well. So how it works for HMOs in Oxford is you need a license, check this out on, on, on the HMO website, on the council website in Oxford, but I'm very confident this is correct. So a HMO will need a license even if there's only three people in the house. Normally for a HMO, there's gotta be five or more people for you to need a HMO license. Whereas in Oxford, three people or more, you need a license. That's my understanding. Getting a license is not that difficult. It might cost around about 800 pounds. That will last five years. So that's the rules in Oxford about licensing, which I think was your question. So check it out on Google. You can find all this information out on Google though, just by typing in HMO rules in Oxford and it will all come up. So good luck, go smash it. HMO rent to rent, very, very good strategy in Oxford. So good luck to that, good luck with that. All right, Craig Ackerman. He says, hi Samuel, thank you for another great video. You're welcome. By the way, if you're enjoying this video, don't forget to smash the like button. Also, I want your questions. Your questions is what gives me content. So comment like crazy below. Anything at all, comment below. And I'm gonna do my very best to answer your question next week. Even if it's like an offshoot of one of these questions, or you don't quite understand, ask your question. Be specific, below, go. So Craig says, thank you for a great video. I have a question for you. I'm completing on my fourth investment property this week. Respect, congratulations. And I mainly focus on purchasing them at below market value, where I BRRR, which means buy, refurbish, refinance, rent. Good for you, Craig, good job. Managed to negotiate a further 6,000 pounds off of the house I'm about to complete on due to Corona, well done. So the figures all work out very well. My question is, do you think that at some point, even though BRRR model on a single let properties is fairly low risk, if you have the knowledge, do you think at some point you have to make the decision to go on to bigger and better things? Or do you think that if you're having success, then stick to what you know best? Thanks in advance. Craig, that's a really, really good question. And you're, very, you're clearly very successful, you're very smart, and you, you're doing really well. You've got three properties already that have worked really well. You've now got your fourth property. So your question is, if it's not broken, why fix it? right? You're doing it, you're putting your money in, you're pushing the value up by refurbing it, you're refinancing, pulling your money out, and you're recycling again and again, and it's working. Whilst I agree with that to a point, here's what's going to happen. If you keep doing that over and over and over again, and to be honest, this is kind of like what I did, so I understand, you're going to end up with like a massive property portfolio, maybe 20, 30 houses, all these single lets, giving you three, 400 quid a month. You'll be financially free, you'll be reasonably wealthy, but now you've got a whole bunch of properties, a whole bunch of tenants. And personally, I don't think the winner in property is the person who has the most properties. I think the winner is the person who's making the most money. And sometimes we get really hung up on wanting to get lots and lots of properties. What I ended up doing over the last couple of years, I've been selling off all of my small deals and I've been putting them into bigger deals. You will make much more money, Craig, on bigger deals. And the same amount of effort on a small deal is required on a big deal. So if I were you, what I would do, Craig, is I would start going bigger and bigger and scaling up. Now, the reason I tell most people to start with small deals is because you usually mess up on your first deal. When you're just starting out, you mess up. 
Starting out, you want to mess up on the small deals. You want to mess up on these 50 grand, 100 grand houses. You don't want to mess up on buying a piece of land and building eight houses. You don't want to mess up on turning a, a massive pub into 12 apartments. Because you mess up on that and it could bankrupt you. So you want to build to that. But once you've got the experience, if you know how to buy a buy a 80 grand house, spend 20 grand on it, then revalue it at one, two, five and pull your money out. If you know how to do that, <clears throat> you've done that three, four times, I wouldn't keep doing it over and over. I would, I would, I would move to something that's gonna stretch you. I would move to a bigger deal. Maybe say, right, I've done a few single lets and it's kind of working, great. But what's the long-term goal? If your long-term goal is to get 20 of those and then retire, then maybe. But my goal always as a property investor and as an entrepreneur and as a person is to be the biggest version of myself I can be, to make as much money, as much impact, to then help as many people. Like, that's how I think. Big thinker, growing, stretching. So if you're anything like me, what I would do is I'd, I'd, I'd slowly go on to bigger, 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 bigger deals. So then two, three years, you're working on big stuff. Because it's, it's, it's just as easy. Like I bought a castle and that's been renovated. That's given me less headaches than some of my like 300,000 pound deals or even like my 100 grand deals, which is just bizarre because there's so much more money you can, you can afford to pay people to manage it and do it for you. Just as much effort on a big and a small deal. So that's my advice, Craig. Respect. Keep me posted how you're getting on. I hope to see you on Samuel365. Get down to join the community. Um, RB52864. Really? Like, wow, okay, fine. That sounds like a very strange account. Um, you pay yourself 100,000 pounds. Yeah, pretty much. I pay myself 10 grand a month, 120. Uh, but keep the properties in your own name. Uh, not exactly, but anyway. Um, that would be a loss-making exercise. You also said you buy properties via a limited company. Which one is it? Okay, um, both. I used to buy in my own name. Now I buy in a company. I now buy in a company because they changed the rules. They changed the tax rules. It's now more tax efficient to buy in a company. Now I buy in a company. But in the past, I used to buy in my own name. So I don't quite understand the question exactly. I'm kind of a little bit confused, but I hope that clears it up. And also, the properties that I built up over the first like eight years of being a property investor, which I bought in my own name, for me to, tr people often ask me this, they say, Sammy, I've got properties in my own name, it's no longer tax efficient, how can I transfer them into a company? And the answer is, you can, but it's very expensive. For me to transfer my properties from my personal name into a company, I've looked at it, I'd have to pay stamp duty on every property that I transfer. So it's a very, that's a very expensive exercise. The money that I'd have, the money that it would cost me in stamp duty, in accountancy fees and the rest of it, to transfer my individual properties into a company would be so expensive that it wouldn't be worth the money that I'd save in tax. It doesn't really make any sense. Also, the properties that I own in an individual name are making pretty good cash flow. So while section 24 and the new tax changes have hit me, I'm not gonna lie, they've hit me, but my mortgage payments are quite small, like two, 300 pounds a month, my rent is high. A lot of my houses are HMOs, I'm making like 12, 13, 15, two grand a month. So the mortgage payment's small. So section 24's not hit me as bad as it's hit a lot of amateur landlords that have got, that have got high mortgage and the rent just covers it, it just washes its face. So I'm kind of okay, but now I'm buying in a company and I own quite a lot of houses in the company. Most of them are unencumbered, most of them haven't got mortgages on them. And, 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 and that's, I'm changing that, I'm refinancing, I'm selling, I'm going into bigger deals. So don't 100% understand your question? I'm always very open about me and my business. So yeah, let me, Mr. RB52864, I hope that helped you in your journey. I somehow don't think that it did though. I somehow don't think that you finding out my business helps your business, but maybe it does somehow, I'm not sure. Anyway, good luck. What's next? So wow, so cow. Okay, cool. I, I don't know if that's your real name or your username, but let's see what you got. Hi Samuel, hope you're doing well. I'm doing really well, thanks so much for asking. As a deal sourcer, you're pretty much selling the information about a property. So, can you sell and package any property info around the world? For example, package a Swedish property. Um, yes and no. Firstly, I wouldn't say that you're just selling the information. If you're a deal, if you're a deal sourcer, you're not, you can't charge three, four, five grand just for information in terms of like, here's a property, these are the details, good luck. You, you can't really do that. So, 
you, what you're selling is you're selling, you're selling a package deal. You found a property, you've done your due diligence on it, you've negotiated the price, you've spoke to the seller, you've got an agent in the area that's gonna be able to manage it, you've got it ready, and now you sell it. So can you do that from overseas? Yes, you can. You can do that over the phone, you can negotiate, you can do everything, yet yeah, overseas. Probably better to get someone to view it, but that doesn't need to be you. So you can do it from overseas, you can package deals from all over the country, all over the world, and you can sell them from a laptop from home. You can, but don't get it twisted. You're not just selling information. And the reason I say that is because there are some deal sources that just find leads and sell them for extortionate fees. Now, if you wanna sell leads, that's a whole other thing. If you wanna just say, hey, I've got a little bit of an opportunity, I've got this lead that's come in, but you can only sell a lead for like a couple hundred quid, maybe even less. Selling a deal is a different thing. And selling a deal, you, someone needs to have seen it, you need to have properly packaged it and put it together. That's a wrap. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope you did a lot. I look forward to reading your comments below. Drop them, drop them, drop them. Listen guys, if you enjoy this channel, please subscribe, like honestly. And also smash the like button. It helps the algorithm. I love serving you. I love answering your questions. I can't wait to see you on the next video. Don't ask me a question and then don't subscribe because if you ask a question and then I answer it next week, you won't even know I answered it. You won't know I called you out. So you've got to subscribe. You've got to turn on the notification bell. And I look forward to answering more questions next Sunday at 7 p.m. God bless. See you tomorrow.